Michael Hastings' Rolling Stone article that ended the career of General Stanley McChrystal starts like this. Quote, how did I get screwed into going to this dinner, demands General Stanley McChrystal. It's a Thursday night in mid-April, and the commander of all U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan is sitting in a four-star suite at the Hotel Westminster in Paris. He's in France to sell his new war strategy to our NATO allies, to keep up the fiction, in essence, that we actually have allies. Since McChrystal took over a year ago, the Afghan war has become the exclusive property of the United States. Opposition to the war has already toppled the Dutch government, forced the resignation of Germany's president, and sparked both Canada and the Netherlands to announce the withdrawal of their 4,500 troops. That's how Michael Hastings' article about McChrystal started. Those troops from the Netherlands actually did leave Afghanistan yesterday. 1,900 Dutch soldiers pulled out of Afghanistan this weekend, a couple of months after the ruling coalition in their government was thrown out of power, in part because of how much the Dutch really did not want to keep their troops in that war. It's not that hard to imagine a government being thrown out over dissatisfaction with an ongoing, 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 ongoing land war in landlocked Central Asia. I mean, well, look what happened here about Iraq in 2006. Last night's vote was seen as a message, a protest vote on the war in Iraq. Exit polls from Tuesday's election show that voters want a new approach to the war in Iraq. It turned out to be a referendum on the president and the war in Iraq. Now, most Americans are sick and tired of the war in Iraq, and Tuesday they made their voices heard at the ballot box. That was the 2006 election when America got introduced to Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid because Democrats took control of both the House and the Senate, in large part on the strength of anti-Iraq war sentiment in this country. By the next election, which started about five minutes after those midterms, Democrats positioned themselves early in the presidential field on the strength of their opposition to the Iraq war. It was one of the definitive early edges that candidate Barack Obama took over the then presumptive nominee, Hillary Clinton. The last point I'll make is on Iraq. Uh, Senator Clinton brought this up. Uh, I was opposed to Iraq from the start. Uh, and, that, and I say that not just to look backwards, but also to look forwards, because I think what the next president has to show is the kind of judgment uh, that will ensure that we are using our military power wisely. You know, several people who were adamantly opposed to the war in Iraq, like Senator Durbin, voted the same way I did and said at the time that if he thought there was even the pretense that could be used from the language in that non-binding resolution to give George Bush any support to go to war, he wouldn't have voted for it, neither would I. She voted for a war uh, to authorize sending troops into Iraq and then later said this was a war uh, for diplomacy. Uh, I don't think that it, now that may be politically savvy, but I don't think that it offers the clear contrast that we need. By the time Barack Obama was elected president, the Iraq war wasn't the definitive political issue it had been early on in the campaign, in part because, frankly, the financial crisis overtook everything else in the universe of voter concerns, but also in part because U.S. troops leaving Iraqi cities had quieted the daily reports of Americans in danger there. Still, though, the new president pledged in his inaugural address to leave Iraq to its people. And just over a month later, he spoke in detail about doing just that. He spoke about it to the Marines at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, saying, quote, Today I have come to speak to you about how the war in Iraq will end. Let me say this as plainly as I can. By August 31st, 2010, our combat mission in Iraq will end. I intend to remove all U.S. troops from Iraq by the end of 2011. And so it goes. Say goodbye to Operation Iraqi Freedom. That ends at the end of this month, when Operation New Dawn begins. As of a month from now, Operation New Dawn is the name that will be used to describe what 50,000 American troops will still be doing in Iraq for another year. The president today addressed the impending change of mission in Iraq when he spoke to the VETS group Disabled American Veterans in Atlanta. As a candidate for president, I pledged to bring the war in Iraq to a responsible end. Shortly after taking office, I announced our new strategy for Iraq and for a transition to full Iraqi responsibility. And I made it clear that by August 31st, 2010, America's combat mission in Iraq would end.
And that is exactly what we are doing, as promised and on schedule. It is true that what's happening in Iraq is an end to the combat mission this month, and it is true that President Obama is doing what he said he would do about Iraq. But he's also doing what George W. Bush obligate us, obligated us to do in Iraq. Our war toppled Saddam Hussein, of course. Iraq got a new government. Even though the U.N. never signed off on Bush invading Iraq, the way we could keep our troops there without being in violation of international law was that the U.N. Security Council annually said it was okay for us to stay there. But the Iraqi government asked the U.N. to stop saying that, to stop giving authorization for foreign troops to occupy their country. And so George W. Bush negotiated a date certain by which we promised to leave. And now the president coming after him is making good on that deal. The exact end date for the combat operations, part of the mission, slid around for a while, but it settled on the end of this month. But the all clear, all out date is still this time next year. It's the, it's the date that Bush agreed with the Iraqis. Same plan to leave, different presidents. We are in year eight of one of our wars. We are in year nine of another of our wars. Both started during slash by the previous administration. Should we expect that we get a break from that now? President Obama today with the disabled American veterans told the story of an army ranger who was severely wounded on his 10th deployment. His 10th. The man is 27 years old, 10 combat deployments. Does having a new president mean that the last president's wars get wound down? Is there a tangible life and death difference between presidents now on national security, between Democrats and Republicans? Will the Afghanistan war really end and soon? Is it possible that another war won't just take its place? Our next guest for the interview tonight says that the answer to those questions is probably no, that the foreign policy consensus is beyond politics, beyond partisanship, that the price of admission, the criteria for being taken seriously in Washington is embracing a vision of America that essentially requires us to be at war one way or another all the time. He is one of the most insistent, readable, compelling critics that we've got in this country right now on any subject. He is Andrew Basevich, and he's next. Stay with us. A week before Congress passed the joint resolution authorizing war against Iraq in 2003, an Illinois state senator stood up before an anti-war rally in Chicago. He described Saddam Hussein as a bad guy who the world and the Iraqi people would be better off without. But then State Senator Obama said this, quote, I also know that Saddam poses no direct threat, no imminent and direct threat to the United States or to his neighbors, that the Iraqi economy is in shambles, that the Iraqi military, a fraction of its former strength, and that in concert with the international community, he can be contained until, in the way of all petty dictators, he falls away into the dustbin of history. I know that even a successful war against Iraq will require an occupation, a U.S. occupation of undetermined length at undetermined cost with undetermined consequences. I know that an invasion of Iraq without a clear rationale and without strong international support will only fan the flame of the Middle East and encourage the worst rather than best impulses of the Arab world and strengthen the recruitment arm of Al Qaeda. I'm not opposed to all wars, he said. I'm opposed to dumb wars. The number of U.S. troops in Iraq since that young state senator became president of the United States has dropped by 90,000 and will apparently drop to zero by this time next year. The number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, however, since that young state senator became president has tripled. Joining us now is Andrew Basevich. He's professor of history and international relations at Boston University. He retired at the rank of colonel after 23 years in the United States Army. And he's author of the new book, Washington Rules, America's Path to Permanent War. Professor Basevich, thanks very much for being here. Thanks for having me on the program. Um, do you think there's really no difference between Democrats and Republicans on the biggest, most important issues of national security? Uh, the differences are far uh, smaller than one would uh, 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 conclude from all the, the rhetoric and the hype. Uh, I mean, I have long believed that if you're looking for the big truths about American politics, about the way Washington works, you don't look for the differences between the Republicans and the Democrats, you look for the continuities. And I think when it comes to national security policy, going all the way back to the beginning of the Cold War, the continuities are quite evident and very strong and continue down to the present day 
with a president who promised that he was going to change the way Washington works. And that, to you, boils down to Washington rules, this credo that America has to determine sort of the means by which the rest of the world is allowed to run, and that we need to enforce that by global military dominance. That means having troops everywhere all over the world, being able to project force all over everywhere in the world, and being repeatedly almost uh, in a recidivist way, being interventionist all the time. Exactly right. Uh, I mean, I, I was really struck by that quotation from State Senator Obama, who at that point is not a creature of Washington, and who in that, that, that quotation reflected, I think, a real skepticism about the way we do our national security policy. That skepticism today with President Obama has long since vanished. I mean, it, it, you have to be struck by the fact that President Obama has followed a path in Afghanistan that is probably identical to the path that Senator McCain would have followed had we elected Senator McCain uh, president. There is no real change when it comes to national security policy. And as someone who voted for the president and admires the president, I have to say that that absence of change uh, is not only disappointing, I think it may even qualify as tragic. The, the difference that I see between a theoretical McCain presidency and the actual Obama presidency on Afghanistan is that withdrawal deadline. Now, the administration has taken great pains to make that withdrawal deadline for next summer seem very squishy. And if there is no withdrawal, then I'd say you're right. But if there is withdrawal, if they really do wind that war down and end it, and don't let it go on permanently. Isn't that a potential crack in the consensus? Is, isn't a break in permanent war sort of an opportunity to question that as our default path? It, it, it could well be, but I mean, the scenario that you're suggesting is one in which President Obama in the summer of 2011 is in effect, I think, gonna have to say, the decision I made back in December of 2009 was, a, was an incorrect decision, uh, and now, now please elect me to a second term as your, as your president. I mean, he is really going to be, I think, in a, in a real political pickle. Because when we get to next summer, uh, it's highly unlikely that the, the, the conditions in Afghanistan will be any better than they are today. Can't I mean, that the, the counterinsurgency strategy devised by General McChrystal, and I think endorsed by General Petraeus, is not working. Couldn't that reasonably be a grounds to explain why we're leaving, though? To say, hey, counterinsurgency isn't making things any better. Us staying there isn't going to make things any better. Let's try to do it in a civilian, diplomatic, aid-based way oh, we're I, leaving. I mean, I, I would hope that he would say that. Uh, and, and indeed, if he did, if, if we have seen the failure of the conventional military instrument. We've seen the failure of shock and awe. Counterinsurgency is supposed to be sort of the new American way of war that, that does it better. If the president says, well, counterinsurgency doesn't work either, then yes, that really could, I think, create an opportunity for a, a fundamental rethinking of how we uh, imagine military power can be can be utilized, and would, we would find ourselves greatly sort of shrinking the domain in which we would uh, see military power as useful, something which I think would be wonderful. I just think that the politics are going to make that very, very difficult for him mm -hmm. to do. It is interesting, though. I've, I've read all of your books. I've interviewed you a number of times, as you know, and I find your thinking on this stuff very interesting. But I felt like in this, in Washington Rules, I started to see through your eyes a way that this thing that you decry, this consensus, might end. It's conceivable. I don't think you're hopeful about it, but I do think it's conceivable. Well, I think, I mean, to, to my mind, if, it's ever, if the consensus is ever going to be confronted and challenged, I believe that the challenge is gonna to have to come from us. It's gonna to have to come from Americans. And alas, that's not gonna happen until Americans come to appreciate all of the consequences of our misguided wars. Some of those consequences are moral. Some of those consequences are fiscal. I think some of those consequences are strategic. Alas, in this open-ended military project that began after 9-11, uh, the American people have pretty much checked out of the net. You know, uh, very few of us sacrifice, yeah. not too many of us serve. Uh, none of us are even asked to pony up the money to pay for these wars. That just gets passed on to somebody, some other generation to deal with. 
So we, the people, I think, have failed in our responsibility as much as our political leaders have failed in their responsibility in this regard. Professor Andrew Basevich, uh, thanks for your service in the Army. Thanks for your service uh, as a critic uh, of foreign policy and war policy um, in your time since leaving the Army. As, as I said, I've been a real admirer of yours for a long time. Thanks for being here on the show. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thanks. The book is called Washington Rules, America's Path to Permanent War.